Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us again, big numbers this week. Um, and it's certainly been a busy week. Every week seems to get busier and busier, but this last week in a very good new, in a good way with the easing of restrictions gradually coming in across the country. Northern Territory clubs are opening as of Friday this week, WA clubs next week, and uh, I think other states and territories will not be too far away in the coming weeks. So all the support that we've, we've tried to provide so far, the education initiatives, the, the access to the My Gym is online, still very relevant because a lot of us are still in that space. But our focus is certainly now turning to providing support in regards to reactivation or reopening or rebooting, whatever we want to call it. And I'm sure this is very much on all of your minds as well. So that when you get the green light locally to be able to reopen, that magical day that you're all ready to go in the safest way possible. I think if you, you remember, if I mentioned in my very first webinar that, that our mantra at GA throughout this whole situation has been to manage today to enable tomorrow. Well, the great news is uh, tomorrow is now well and truly on its way with those restrictions easing across the country. And it's probably, thankfully, come upon us uh, quicker than we probably would have expected a month or so ago, which is great news. In respect of the timing of reopening, it will be on a state by state basis, and even within some states or territories on an even more localised regional basis. GA has drafted an, an advocacy letter that we've sent to all the, the state and territories for them to add their signature to, signature to if they wish, if they think that it will be beneficial to help influence the timing of local public health authorities and government authorities. Uh, we sent to a couple of states yesterday and we had very immediate and positive feedback from those health authorities in those states. So we're all working um, and I know your states and territory associations, they're really driving this process at that local level and everyone was working extremely hard to make sure that we can reassure the authorities that as a sport, as an organisation, we will adopt a responsible, safe and cautious approach and that we will have controls in place to be able to make sure that we can reopen our doors safely. And that's obviously what's of primary importance at the end of the day. So with the primary focus now being on, on reopening, the biggest question that we've been getting is about health and hygiene in clubs. How do you prepare that club environment to be able to safely open your doors? How can we a, reassure the authorities that we can open in a safe and responsible manner? And also how can you as a club owner reassure your members and participants and staff that you're taking all the precautions that are required to take? We're developing a series of, of fact sheets and guidelines. Um, four or five of them went up on the website on Friday night and more will today and in the coming days. These are all based on the national principles for the resumption of sport and recreation that was released about 10 days ago, and also the AIS framework for rebooting sport. GA was involved in contributing to both those documents, as was our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Cathy Yu, who's joining us today, and I'll introduce and, and chat to Cathy uh, very shortly. So these fact, sheet, fact sheets are being uploaded onto our new Rebooting Gymnastics page on the GA website. So I really encourage you all to jump on to that new page on the website and have a look at all the resources that we're putting up there. I do need to, to stress in respect of those guidelines and fact sheets though, that they're based on the national principles. First and foremost, you all must be guided by your local state or territory association. And requirements, regulations are going to differ from state to state. So while we strongly encourage you to read and acknowledge and understand the national principles and our guidelines, it's your state association that will be able to provide you with the best direction as to what is required in your particular geographic area. While a restart is, is very exciting, obviously, for all of us to think that we can be back you know, term two, term three. We must, absolutely must, approach any reopening with caution. The last thing we want to see, anyone wants to see, is an outbreak in any gymnastics venue or gymnastics club, or indeed in any sport. 
be it swimming or gymnastics or volleyball or whatever it might be, because anything like that is only going to set us as sports sector and us as gymnastics back a whole lot of steps in reopening on a broader scale. So we must be very careful to be aware of the restrictions in place and to take every possible precaution to prepare ourselves and to probably err on the side of caution. The problem is with this in many, in many ways, there's no specific do's and don'ts. There's national principles, there's state guidelines and, and someone in WA sent me through a whole list of questions with specific questions because the states or, or, or national issue these guidelines, but they're not specific to gymnastics or to any particular sport. So it's up to us to interpret them. And a lot of that interpretation and a lot of that decision making will have to happen at club level, will have to be done by you guys. And the underlying principle is to adopt common sense. And as I said before, probably to earn more on the side of cautions. You will need to make some decisions at club level within the parameters that the government regulations stipulate. But so long as we, we you, can make these decisions in a preventative, methodical, cautious and evidence-based manner to the best of your abilities, that's what we need to do. To help inform or to help to try and help inform your decision making though, that's why we've invited Dr. Cathy to join us today. As I said, Dr. Cathy has been instrumental in helping develop those national principles and the AIS rebooting framework. She's incredibly busy at the moment, so I really thank Cathy firstly for, for all her advocacy and all the work that she's been doing on behalf of gymnastics and on behalf of all of you, our clubs, at the national level, um, but also very much for, for giving up half an hour of her time today to, to come and join us on this webinar. We thought it would be useful just to do a, a Q&A and, and really relay a lot of the questions that we've been getting from you uh, for me to ask those of Cathy today and provide some answers. As usual, we've got the questions in the chat function on the side. We've got a couple of people in the background who will try and answer those questions as they come up. So I encourage you to have that chat on the, the right-hand side um, of your screen. Those that we can't get to or those that we're not able to provide an answer to today, as usual, we'll put them on our FAQs and, um, and add them onto the rebooting page on our website after today's webinar. So Dr. Cathy, firstly, welcome for joining us. I can't see you on my screen, but I'm sure if you talk, you will pop up. Uh, here we go. Yep. I'm there you are. muted yes, now. Thank you. you. Thank you very much for having me. And I, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't hold anybody up. No, no, no. All good. We acknowledge how busy your, your time is. Um, so, Dr. Cathy, I, I, it's probably good to, to start first just chatting about general athlete and staff health and safety in respect of when could, should uh, a club exclude uh, a member or staff member from, from the club and training? And what's the process for managing the actual health um, of staff and athletes coming into the venue? Okay, so certainly, um, you know, we're in a very lucky position here in Australia where the, um, the actual rates of COVID-19 are quite low at present. Right, but there is still, especially in Victoria, there's still evidence of what we call community spread, where um, there, there's cases popping up within the community with no particular um, uh, incident or contact with somebody who's a known case. And so these cases are around, and the problem with COVID-19 and a lot of other infections is that people are infectious before they become symptomatic and so really the the principles that we've been working on with respect to all the distancing measures and the um restrictions on travel and all of those sorts of things is kind of this assumption that that you could be infected without knowing it and thus be able to somehow pass it on to other people if you are not um if you're in close contact with them, if you're not careful, all those things. and Or you could be on the receiving end of somebody doing that. And so that's basically the principle of, of how we should be managing these 
incidence. So anybody who's got respiratory symptoms absolutely should not come to work. Or like, if you're a coach and you wake up with a sniffle, you should not tough it out. And I know in Australia, we used to have this kind of attitude where we should soldier on, that you just take a couple of Panadol and then still show up to work. That is absolutely not the case now because a couple of Panadol make you feel better, but does not make you any less infectious. So it, it's really important. Anybody who has any respiratory illness or a fever does not attend the facility. So whether you're a staff member, whether you're an athlete, this has to be clearly kind of documented and educated to your communities. Now, when somebody does have a fever, the chances are that it isn't going to be COVID-19, that it's probably just going to be some other cold. It could be even be an influenza, which can make people pretty sick. But you don't know that, number one. So they get excluded. It is appropriate for those people to just stay at home in self-isolation. So that's that self-isolation where nobody mandates it, but you just exclude yourself from dealing with other people so that that person does not have the opportunity to then pass on whatever infection that they have to anybody else. And that should be a period of at least 72 hours. And so what we say is if you just wake up with a bit of a sniffle, but kind of it's gone by the the end of the day, if you are clear tomorrow and also clear the next day, if you can make 72 hours of zero symptoms, then you are safe to start coming back um, to whatever activity that you were doing. Okay, so that is true for children, for adults, um, everybody. So 72 hours exclusion. Now, if you're particularly ill, then it, it is recommended that you go and see your doctor. You call your doctor first because no doctor wants an active COVID-19 case landing on their doorstep without adequate kind of controls, infection controls around that. But you, you either call your state and territory um, COVID-19 response line or the national response line and get the, um, get the advice there. You might have to be tested in this particular time. We've got a lot of capacity for testing. We're trying to test as many people as possible in every state. And so getting the testing done, even if you're negative for COVID-19, then if you had some kind of infection, you should be infect you should be symptom free for 72 hours before returning. So the there's a couple of scenarios actually listed in the athlete and staff's health and safety resource that's on the website too. So go and have a look at that one. Thanks, Kathy. And I think um so you're right, and, and you help contribute, and thank you very much to the to the athlete and staff health and safety. That's one of the fact sheets that was put up on the website on, on Friday. There's that side of it, and I think the, the education and the information about personal health and safety, I think, is, has been in the environment for, for a long time now, and so people should be aware of that. I think for the clubs on board today, what, what would really be of interest is your guidance on how they can ensure as hygienic an environment as possible within the actual club. So what are your sort of top tips to, for maintaining a, a clean and hygienic environment within the actual club venue? Okay, so this, this one has been um, quite a bit <laughs> of talk around it. It is, it, it, you know, everybody says, oh, you should wipe down your surfaces and you should wear gloves and do all of those sorts of things. It's just absolutely not, possible to do that in a gymnastics club environment and with the surfaces that we have. So really the, the most important thing about maintaining good hygiene and, and thus infection control is personal responsibility. And so that means that the person coming into the club has to ensure as best as possible that they are germ free. So that, that means that oh, with all of this opening up, people are going to be coming into contact with lots more people outside of the club and perhaps bringing those infections back into the club. So again, it's about education and saying to people, okay, well, you need to be really sure that you're not bringing something into the club. And then whatever you've got or whatever each individual person has on them, they keep to themselves. And so that means maintaining social distancing or physical distancing in as much as is possible within the club environment. Now, a close contact is defined as 
more than 15 minutes within the 1.5 meter radius. Okay, so if you've just passed somebody by, even if you pass them by very close, the risk of transmission is extremely low. All right, so even if you're full of COVID-19, if you pass somebody by on the street, you're unlikely to pass it on. So from a club environment, that means that you, you encourage people not to huddle together, that you don't talk right into each other's faces because it is respiratory spread. And so, you know, stand apart if you're gonna be talking to each other for any length of time. Don't line up, you know, don't get the athletes um, huddling together and doing their warm up all in one little clump. Keep them physically separated as much as possible by that 1.5 meters. Um, so personal hygiene is the, the most important, that there's lots of hand sanitizer because everybody's gonna to be touching all of the surfaces in the gym. And some of those surfaces, like we said, cannot be simply cleaned. So if your hands are clean when you touch the surfaces, there's much less likelihood of transmission. Um, and, and also, you know, from a cleaning point of view, then perhaps looking at those high touch areas that people haven't hand sanitized yet. So your door handles, your light switches, um, you know, locker doors, all of those sorts of things, those surfaces are very easily disinfected. And so you can use an alcohol-based or a, um, a bleach-based disinfectant on those things without any problem. And you can do that, you know, once a day is practical. I think any more becomes a little bit less practical. Um, which brings you to the point of how often should you clean your club? And that again differs amongst different clubs as well. Um, but, but really, I mean, your normal vacuuming, all of that kind of stuff should be definitely done. Um, dust in itself is not a risk factor for respiratory infections, but you know, if you can see dust around, then it's harboring lots of other things as well. I do wanna say one thing about foam pits. Um, that, that infections can live in foam pits for a long time. And we, we see this all the time in any case. And so given this particular um, infection being such a troublesome one, my recommendation would be that you actually put a, a covering of some description over your foam pit. The kids can still land in it, but you're not going to get the foam flying around everywhere and the big sort of plume of, um, of, of puff of whatever contamination that comes out of foam pits popping out of the foam pit. So if you cover it up, it's still a nice soft landing surface. You can't dig into it. And, and that would make the foam pit particularly a lot, lot safer. Um, Kelly, there's some really good um, practical tips there. You mentioned equipment and, and clearly specialised gymnastics equipment is it's different, you know, you, you can't compromise some of the materials in some of the apparatus that we have and bars or beams, for instance, because, you know, eventually that could compromise the, the structure and the safety of it if you use um, disinfectants on it that aren't suitable. I know that uh, our equipment partner, Spieth, is doing an enormous amount of work uh, and our local equipment partner, Amco and Pascal, is liaising with Spieth and they're developing some really detailed, specific guidelines um, about cleaning and evidence-based, world health-based um, information on cleaning specialist equipment. That's what we hope to bring you at next Wednesday's webinar and have Pascal online as well from ANCO to talk about how we actually clean that specialised equipment. But I think Cathy's um, point at the moment about the responsibility being with the personal is a very good one. Cathy, I just, I'd like to ask you something you mentioned to us um, the other day with everyone thinks of hand sanitizer and it's called hand sanitizer, but for gymnastics especially, feet. Don't forget your feet and elbows. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so, I mean, you could just kind of like put it everywhere, but um, look, the, the hands obviously are gonna touch things a lot. Feet is a lot less of an issue. I, I think feet should be clean, but you don't have to kind of scrub your feet in your um, your alcohol solution. And it's primarily because your feet don't usually come near your mouth. So <laughs> from, from that, usually. Um, the, the hands are really important because if you're touching a surface and your hands become contaminated and then you rub your face, mess with your hair, do all of those sorts of things that gymnasts always do, um, 
then that runs the risk of taking that contamination from your hands and getting it inside your body and causing trouble. So feet are much less likely. Yes, feet should be clean. And feet are obviously going to pick up everything from the surfaces that you touch. But so long as your feet don't then head towards your mouth, then you're, you're much better off. Elbows and things. Now, this is an interesting one because we're now telling everybody you've got to cough into your elbow, but often coaches are going to hold the elbow. And so coaches have to be really aware that, there, it's very important for them to also sanitise. Now, it is impractical to sanitise between every athlete. I mean, you'd use litres of this stuff and yet your skin would probably break down after a couple of days in any case. But it's really important that if you've been spotting an athlete, say you've spotted one athlete several times, you may want to, or if it's appropriate, if, it, if it's um, available, you should perhaps sanitise before you go to the next athlete. But if you're going to do a few athletes in succession, so long as it's that same group, so, so your one group is going to be um, sharing their germs a bit more among just that group, because this is all about um, minimising how much spread this virus can have. So if you've got a group of five students, five athletes then that group of five train together with the one coach all of the time so if one person gets ill in that five there's only a possibility that five of them would get ill as opposed to having that one person doing lots and lots of different things with lots of groups and then suddenly one person gets ill their close contacts can number in the 20s 30s um, and then you end up in a lot more trouble so it, it, the the group structure and the group um, the, the group composition being stable is partly an infection control measure but partly also that if an infection gets in it doesn't get everywhere um, and I think so that's another of the tips that we're doing Kathy is on programming exactly that if, if you've got a, a group of you know eight kids in a class that they stay in that group every Monday at 11 o'clock, whatever it is, exactly as Cathy said, to try and minimise the, the spread. Yeah. Cathy, you, you mentioned... Yeah, that's uh, where that COVID safe app comes into it as well, that, you know, if, if you're in contact with a zillion people, then you want to know who those people are. And we would, we would recommend on all the fact sheets that we're putting out, and I know Dr Cathy certainly would recommend this, uh, it may be that at club level you mandate, require, well, you can't actually mandate someone to download it, but you strongly um, encourage all your members or anyone walking through your door of your club to download that COVID Safe app. That could be a preventative measure that, that you could um, try to put in place at your particular, uh, your particular venue. Cathy, you mentioned spotting there, and there's been a lot of questions, clearly from a safety perspective in our sport, as opposed to majority of other sports, we need to spot so what are some guidelines from your point of view um, for coaches and spotting? Okay, so again, when we talk about that close contacts being 15 minutes, you're very unlikely to be inside of one and a half metres or you, you, sh you should be easy to avoid being inside of one and a half metres of somebody's space for 15 minutes. So the spotting question is not as scary as we all were worried about because if you step in, spot, step out again, then you're only within that 1.5 metre space for a very short time. Maybe a second is what most of the things that you spot are going to be. So it, it really means that from a practice point of view, like say you're at the bars and you're spotting, that you don't have the athlete kind of hang out with you on that spotting box or on, on your platform or whatever it is for 10 minutes waiting for the next turn, that one person occupies that space at a time the other person gets onto the bar you spot them and then you separate out again so the spotting thing actually is not so bad if you if if both the gymnast and the coach have sanitized their hands as much as possible which is you know what's going to be touching people then um and you're not within that 1.5 meters of getting the droplet spread then that's a lot lot safer it's a low risk um, activity but of course if you do it a lot then your risk gets higher it's just a volume thing i think it's a, it's a really important question i know we've been we've been getting that a lot can you spot so the answer is yes but 
but based on um, based on the guidelines that Kathy's just indicated. Um, another another mantra I know, Kathy, that you've been using a lot is the whole concept of relevant to spotting, but also general activities. Get in, train, get out a, as a mantra. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. So we've we've put this into the AIS document a couple of times as well, and really what this means is. Uh, the, the purpose of it is to decrease the amount of time that we're in contact with lots of people. So, for instance, an athlete will come into training. They come in at the time that they're going to have their training. They don't come in and hang out with their friends 15 minutes beforehand and sit around. And they don't hang around afterwards having a snack. That that they come in ready to train, they're dressed, they're not going to be congregating in change rooms, they're not going to be congregating in, you know, the common areas. They do the training that has to be done and, and limit their exposure and your exposure just to that amount of time and then they go out again, do all of the other things that they need to do at home. So, you know, shower facilities and things like that, they should just go home and have a shower. Um, rather than mucking around and particularly meals. It has been shown that, that sharing meals is a very, very effective way for this virus to spread. And it is because you sit opposite one another that, that you, I mean, you're hopefully not sharing cutlery or anything. We never have recommended any of that. But say you've got a common dish of food that people are taking some from, but, but basically it's, you're going to sit in close contact with each other and maybe speak to each other and thus have that droplet spread. So it's about just lessening the amount of congregating, lessening the amount of exposure, both by time and by distance as much as possible. So that's what that get in, train, get out really does mean. Dr. Cathy, and I can see a lot of questions coming through on the side. We're, we're trying to answer some of them as we can. Um, other ones we'll, we'll take on notice. And I think uh, because there are so many questions and specific questions, a lot of them do relate, I think, especially from, from WA with an imminent reopening there um, to local guidelines. So again, I would stress that um, those local guidelines are best coming from your, your state and territory association, but obviously we will, we will help and provide guidelines and advice as much as we can. Kathy, with, with the likely or the, you know, the imminent reopening of, of a lot of clubs, again, as I said, in a staggered approach, what, what else should these guys be thinking about? What are the top five tips or the top three tips um, that clubs can be doing now in the lead up to a potential reopening in the weeks ahead? So I think probably the most important thing is educating your membership um, and, and making sure that that they have the sort of um, information that we have about what really has to be their responsibilities. We're, we're all very dependent upon what other people are doing, okay? So as we open up a little bit more, we don't know whether the next person has been properly kind of distancing themselves or has sanitized their hands or all of those sorts of things. So we have to take responsibility ourselves to say, okay, I don't know whether you have an infection, so I'm going to stay away from you. I'm going to keep my hands clean. If I touch you, so for instance, I'm still working as a doctor. If I see somebody here in the clinic, I'll hand sanitize, I'll wear gloves, I'll do all of those sorts of things because there's an assumption that you might be infected that, and I don't know about it and I really don't want to get it. So education number one, really think about reducing the opportunity for exposure. So just look at how people gather, how people get in and out of the club. Again, GA's got a really good resource for this um, on the website. It's the preparing the environment um, resource there. And it runs through a checklist of things that you need to think about and, and fit it into your club. But it's all about personal hygiene, about people taking that personal responsibility. And the other thing is about expectations to say, okay, yes, we're reopening, but this is not business as usual. This is not that that you can just go back and do everything 100% of what you were doing before, that this is a long-term thing, that we're going to have to be managing this infection and reducing the likelihood of second wave um, infections and all of those sorts of things for a long time. And when I say a long time, it's at least a year. So 
having that as an expectation to say, this is the way it's going to be putting in place something that is manageable for a long time, okay, um, is really important. Now, I, I did notice there was a, a question about partner ACRO. And, and, and again, you're allowed to exercise with one other person. It is supposed to be sort of very distant. I think if people are in, obviously, if people are in the same household, that is fine. <laughs> But the, the regulations at present say that, that it should be non-contact. Now, I, I realise that that's very hard for some of the sports where you're going to do group things. But really, if, if we can get this stage done, see how we go with it. Are there going to be an uptick in infection rates and things like that? Then we can start to move on the other things. But it would be a mistake to go back and go, yeah, it's going to be fine. We're opening up. We're going to do everything as per normal, that is the way to absolutely ensure that we get a second wave of infections. And it would be, you, I don't know if you've been following the news on Victoria, but that cluster in the meat factory is now up to 80, 85 cases from one worker attending this factory. One worker's spread it to the other workers. Those other workers have taken it home to their families and the cluster is 85 people. Now, that, that's just horrendous. So we don't want that occurring. That's the reason why we're doing, um, we're, we're recommending these things in this way. So, um, yeah, it's a little hard, but, but we've got to get used to something like this. I think that's I think that's great advice that that it's not going to be business as usual and for quite a while yet and we all need to to play our role as hard as it's going to be and as much as we think oh it won't happen to us uh, we all need to really take on that personal responsibility. I just there's been a lot of questions about acro and and thank you Kathy for for bringing it up and when we were talking to to David Hughes um, from the AIS who was the the main author of that AIS rebooting document. And interestingly, I've just come off a call with other NSOs, other national sporting organisations, and rowing was another one saying, can you have a, a pair or a double skull or, you know, four people in a boat? Um, it, again, it's, it's really hard and not sort of contradicting anyone, but I think with ACRO, it's, it's almost a similar approach potentially to the spotting. If you minimise that contact, uh, you make sure you take the personal responsibility uh, personal hygiene responsibility, sorry, before you engage in a, in a pair or a, a trio. Um, I think that's one of those common sense decisions that need to be managed at a, at a local level. Um, and if you make sure that you are taking all the precautions um, and minimising the time when there is contact, um, that it's, it, it, it is a grey area, but I think it's something that if we adopt common sense to, uh, that, that we don't have to necessarily uh, prohibit that group work in um, in ACRO at this point in time. Another question, Kathy. If while you're on the line, I know we've gone a little bit over, but I think this is fantastic conversation and um, the number of questions. It's it's obviously very important to all our clubs. Uh, is a question about sweat. Um, medically, can sweat transmit COVID? What's what's the go with there's, that? There's no evidence of that at present. So. I think they've found it in faeces. I would hope that faeces are not in our gyms and on our surfaces, um, and but much more so in respiratory droplets. So uh, hand hygiene, bathroom hygiene, that's um, and, and not getting in people's faces and, and talking to them for long periods of time. Like that's really the best protection that we have. Sweat is okay. But again, if you're rolling around on a surface where somebody has coughed onto that surface and then you're rolling around and it's on you, then you can become kind of indirectly contaminated by that. So if it's on your arm, you give your arm a rub, and then you rub your face. That's how these things can be transmitted. Well, there's a lot of information in there. Um, I've seen a few of you on screen scribbling down madly. I've seen a lot of questions come through, as I said, that we've tried to answer. Uh, we'll put a lot of the questions up as FAQs. Um, just a reminder that we do record all these webinars, so please feel free to um, uh, have a look at it again to take down any notes and also to share with any of your coaches or anyone else. This is something, it does come down to, as Cathy said, to education, to communication, to managing expectations and ultimately to personal responsibility. 
And if we all play our role in doing that, in, in being cautious in our approach, in being methodical in our approach, in not assuming, oh yeah, that'll be okay. If you're not sure if it's a gray area, probably err on the side of, maybe we won't do that quite yet until we've got into a bit of a routine. And acknowledging with your staff uh, and with your members and your participants and your athletes that it will not be, as Kathy said, it will not be business as usual next week or the week after or the week after that when we're all able to, to reopen. Dr. Kathy, I can't thank you enough um, for joining us today. I don't know if you have any final parting words of wisdom. Um, not um, look, I, I see that there's a whole lot of questions about kinder gym and parents and kids and, and so forth. So I'll just answer this one really quickly. So obviously parents and children, they're already sharing their own germs in the household. They're welcome to continue sharing their germs together anyway but don't share them with other parents and other children like that's where the distancing comes into it um I, I think when they talk about children spreading the infection that is a very difficult question it has been shown that adults spread it much more effectively than children kids don't get as sick they probably don't have as big as a viral like burden so they don't spread as much virus around as an adult can spread so this is the kind of principle by which they're saying that schools are safe. Um, our gym clubs and our uh, programs have the same age group. And so the kids aren't so much of the problem. Stop the parents from congregating around, but parents and their own children, absolutely fine. So write your questions down, send them to GA. If we see a lot of things that are all the one question, we'll, we'll answer those, you know, as they come through. Yep, perfect. Thank you so much again, Dr. Cathy. I know how busy you are. And um, again, just on behalf of, of all of us and all our clubs and all our members, uh, thank you for everything that you're doing for, for our sport and for sport in general to help us uh, getting back to whatever our new normal will be, whenever it can be. So, so thank you very much. Yep, good luck um, to everybody. Thanks, Cathy. Um, I do encourage you, as I said, to, to jump onto the website, have a look at our new rebooting page. Uh, we uploaded a few fact sheets last week. We'll do more in the coming days. A lot of it addressing some of the questions that have come up today and some of your questions from the, from the chat. And also, as I said, next week, what we hope to have on the webinar next week is quite a um, specific and, and detailed information about cleaning and hygiene and disinfecting of gymnastics specific uh, equipment. So we hope to bring that to you next week. Um, Thank you very much. Stay safe, everybody. Have a good rest of the week and we'll, um, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.